Hello, welcome to another episode of the Dealer Talk Podcast. This is your host, Herb Anderson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, today's session, we have an amazing guest. Uh, we're going to be talking about fixed operations and you know some other things. Um, let's get into it. Uh, without further ado, John Fairchild. What's going on, sir? How are you? Not much. Uh, everything's going great. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, appreciate you working this out so we could get this done. Thank you very much. This is exciting. Yeah, man. No, I know we've been talking for a minute about doing this deal. We were gonna, we were shooting for season three, but we were already, um, you know, kind of yeah. into the, into the season. So, uh, but I'm I'm glad you're on now, man, and excited to have a conversation. Um, how about you kick us yeah. off with your, with your background? You know, that's always the first question I ask, and then we kind of go from there. Well, I appreciate that. I uh, I entered the car business at the ripe old age of fifteen, um, wow. kind of as a um, defiance against my father, who had a uh, bunch of machine shops that he ran, and I'd already been working in the machine shops, and uh, just the the way that they didn't allow us to adjust the machines, I had to sit there and operate a machine all day long, you know, in my summer break and after school, and I was just bored of it and so i went uh, a buddy of mine had a job at a local uh dealership that he was giving up to take a cross-country trip and he recommended me and so 15 years old i went and uh and got that job and basically what it was was the cleanup boy and uh they actually called me boy and uh they you know when when stuff needed to clean it up i'd clean it up and and i did it enthusiastically and you know back in 1980 for five bucks an hour under the table and you know it was a lot of you know it was good money for me and so uh i did it enthusiastically and and never let them caught me catch me slouching um but that lead led me to have a little bit of experience that allowed me to get a job in the parts department and um from there um i left california at uh at age 19 to move to georgia like i was just talking to you about and at that time i was i, I had a, a girlfriend that her father was the service manager at the local toyota dealership coincidentally and uh he lived out here in georgia and we we came out to visit and the next year we moved back and he he got me a job actually for four dollars an hour at the um at, in the parts department of their uh sister store they had two stores and, and one was toyota and the other was uh, lincoln mercury amc jeep renault at the time so wow, um man. started there at four dollars an hour i ended up staying there 10 years and um i was the only person there that entire 10-year time and we went through five owners in that 10-year time from then so it was good experience and it was uh definitely uh some hard knocks there within that too but from there i moved to a uh the, the dealership ship got sold one more time and i started looking around and a friend of mine who had previously worked there was a um general manager at another store and he hired me as their fixed ops director and i ended up being the fixed ops director there at a ford store for about four years uh six years and um during that time, it was really um, influential near the end is that I had a mentor that was assigned to me by the manufacturer. And so they they would put uh, put a consultant in the stores that they felt could use the help or were open to the help and had somebody that would accept the help. And I was one of them. And um, I learned so much from that guy. His name is Mike Poole. He's retired now. but um, tremendous guy i learned so much from him well i ended up leaving that store and went into business with a buddy of mine doing accessories for dealers on our own and during that time about 10 months into that i ran into mike Poole at a dealership and uh he said you know what are you doing man and uh i told him and um said it was going pretty good and making good money etc and he said well you know would you be interested in interviewing with us Long story short, I got put on, uh, I got hired. Um, well, when we got, when I got hired, we had an assigned territory and I didn't have to do any selling of my services for the first six months because we were assigned to stores, but this was in um, 1999. And um, what happened was, is, is they, 
the, the company I was working for got dropped. And so we did, we no longer had an OEM to put the barrel. Yeah. And okay. so what happened was we had a huge staff of consultants. I think there was 101 of us actually. And they tasked us with developing our own book of business. And um, after six months, there was only about eight of us left. But what it taught me was, you know, from soup to nuts, how to um, how to go after and get the business as well as um, everything from stem to stern about it, uh, from the needs assessment down to the exit meeting and sustainment. Um, so um, I worked for them for about six years and um, I couldn't go out on my own because they had a non-compete. Yeah, and of course. They had actually sued a couple guys that tried to go out. Well, they did go out on their own. And so I was like, I was kind of scared of that. So I, I left though, because I had a young family and I was spending way too much time on the road and feeling pretty guilty about it, not spending time seeing my wife and children. So um, I, I endeavored to go into a, um, this is like back in uh, 2005 and I, uh, I went in, uh, we created, a friend of mine and I created a advertising venue. This is before the internet really took off for all of advertising. And back then we had a huge secondary finance market. And what it was, was a magazine for dealers to advertise their uh, wares in. So for that four year period, I was hounding dealers uh, for ads on a weekly basis. So I never knew one week to the next you know, I had great clients and people that would be there every week, but I certainly had a fair share of people who would uh, drop you. So it really honed my skills. And yeah, well, no, actually it was just for sales, for, for vehicle sales, but I did have a fixed operations section. I did have a, a fixed operations advertising section that I, uh, you know, obviously since that was my forte, I, I did uh, get as many clients as I could there too. But, um, you know, right when the, um, in 2000, Eight, 2009 when the financial crisis hit um that that business was kind of drying up so i uh, i exited and started what i'm doing now fairchild automotive solutions and uh i've been in business so uh, september was 10 years wow man that's amazing dude and i definitely oh, I want to, yeah man i want to talk more about that because i know there's some 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 similarities in our in our background when it comes to that but um you know, your story kind of brings up a point that I've never really talked about on, on the podcast because the, you know, just the guest hasn't really uh, had a, a you there. The background, yeah, to kind of have that conversation. And the conversation is, is geared towards what you were talking about prospecting and cold calling, right? Because that's something that I yeah. do. Um, I mean, I used to do a lot more of it in the beginning now because of you know, things like the podcast and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's a little bit easier, but mm -hmm. I um how do i say this so i've never been afraid to cold call dealerships never yeah and the reason i've never been afraid to is because i believe in the products and solutions that i offer but i do know a lot of people man that are terrified of it oh me too and, yeah man and i always wonder like dude how, how many people are missing out on you know because you never know man you know what i mean like you could have the, the the solution or you could be maybe it's not the company but maybe you're the guy that can help that dealership you know what i mean Oh, absolutely. And, so, and, and I've, I, um, I grew to, to relish cold calling after I figured out that I could uh, do quite well on a commission only structure. You know, I was initially afraid of it, as most people were as uh, in the dealership life uh, and really as a consultant working for a major company. Um, I had had a salary component, but, um, you know, I, I think that my comfort level just came from being in so many dealership scenarios mm -hmm. and knowing that the, that guy is just like you and pulls his pants on the same way. Yeah. And, you know, as far as being cold called, I can tell you a number of different occasions where I was, you know, almost physically thrown out of the dealership and, oh, yeah. uh, and I, on, on a couple <laughs> subsequent occasions, I'd walk in and say, hey, where you been? I've been looking for you. We need to run an ad or whatever the case may be. So, you know, I, I don't really have a fear level of, uh, you know, or really an uncomfortable, I don't really get uncomfortable at all being in that environment because I kind of feel at home there. Right. But you've been on both ends, right? So you've yeah. been on the desk, you know, like me, I was a service manager too, before I was on the vendor side. So I, I'll admit, man, like I was one of those guys that would be like, no, you know, leave me alone sort of oh, a deal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, 
Me but too. having that perspective now, I mean, what what would you say is you know just to leave some tips for maybe any vendors that are listening to this to this to this podcast? No, to, I, you know, yeah. like, don't um, you know? Up. I can't remember. Say, I, that's a very good point because, um, and I can't remember the exact saying from uh, it's a Winston Churchill saying, but basically what it is is to keep the attitude of winning no matter what is happening. And, and you can translate that into even being a service advisor because you're going to get your fair share of people that are going to chew you out or throw you out or, or, or drop you or um, cancel their subscription or whatever you're trying to sell. And, and if you carry that forward to the next engagement, then it's going to show. Yeah. And um, it's it's going to poison the, any prospect. And, and, and a lot of times people can tell that they can they can smell it or whatever it is that they can detect that um, you've got a level of fear or disappointment or you're projecting the negativity and you're projecting that they're going to say no to you. So, you know, I had a staff of people that would help me to sell the, uh, uh, advertising, particularly. Um, and in my consulting business, I, I do, I do all of, of that part of it myself, but, um, you know, the, the staff that I found was the most successful were the people who kind of, you know, got over that and, and just put on, a, um, uh, their bravest face and go to the next dealer and, and, and keep plugging. Yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Thanks for that, man. I really wanted to, to kind of touch on that really quick. I know it's a little off topic, but you know, there are some it, it people out there, a little bit. That, you know, um, uh, that are th that are afraid to walk into the dealership and they can really help. You know what I mean? So, um, oh, all right. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to, I was excited to, to talk to you about was, um, retention, right? Cause I know that you're in the, you know, you're in the dealerships a lot and it's, it's an area yeah. that you and I are both familiar with. Um, but I've never really had that conversation in depth on the show, and I kind of wanted to talk about that, especially right now, because you know, as Mark and Soften softened, excuse me, um, obviously fixed ops right now, which I love, uh, is is getting a lot of attention, right? Oh yeah, um, and so oh, yeah. you know what I mean. And so the 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 big push right now is retention. I mean, it's coming from the manufacturers, it's coming from the decision makers at the dealership. I know I used to, you know, before I started doing my own thing, I was working for. Um, one of the Toyota distributors in Texas, and okay, you know, that, Gulf that was States, a big Toyota. Gulf States Toyota, yeah, yeah. So that was a big, big push. Um, you know, when was so, that? Um, last, uh, let's see. I've been. I left there. It's it was recent, like in August. Okay, so you know, do you know Scott Russo? Um, the vice no. of Gulf States Toyota. He's he's gone now, but he was the vice president um, of fixed ops well, over there. Yeah, I was the GM marketing. So Golf States marketing. The oh, okay, okay, yeah. We did all the, yeah, yeah all the, cool. you know, Toyota Care marketing and that sort of deal. The, I've actually got some dealers that I work with in that market, um, and it's a good market. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, so Toyota was changing their retention metrics and all that deal. So, you know, let's let's kind of talk about that maybe high level, and then maybe get down to some specifics that we can leave behind for. You know, for yeah, no, I'd love to. And, you know, I, I was just actually having a conversation with somebody on Facebook before we came on about uh, retention versus conquest. And you know, what I find and, and what actually what we specialize with my company is um, doing the best job you can with the clients that you have, you know. Um, and what I find is that, uh, you know, often we've got a backlog and not enough staff and, um, you know, we're blowing through those repair orders without really giving the customer all of the uh, of the things that they need to focus on and, and truly advising them. So on a high level, I would definitely say, um, you know, and it, it, it may sound cliche, but that uh, the uh, uh, client relationship is obviously a key component and really in everything you do as a service advisor and interfacing with a customer it's got to hinge on that relationship and let's face it people have to like you and uh you know as uncomfortable as that may be for some personalities i don't think you're in the right spot if you are not embracing a people and looking to um develop relationships 
And, um, you know, people want to know a guy or they want to know a, a lady that's in the business and that they can rely on. So the key number one thing for retention is that basic level human interaction and how much quality can you give that person that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people have said before, this is this is a, a people business that we happen to deal with with cars on. And I really subscribe to that because uh, it's so true that and, you know, people that are at our dealership, if we really are cognizant about customer retention, um, let's face it, they're under our care. And mm -hmm. we really got to do a good job of getting through to them on a personal level. Everything else, uh, you know, is going to flow from there uh, or not or not. Now, you know, yeah, you're going to get occasionally people that are, are introverted or not interested in that. And that's that's true. But, you know, we have to take that approach with everybody that comes in our service department. Um you know, so that's on a on a high level. I think that 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 idea and culture has got to be pervasive at your store, and um, you do have to nurture that in people because a lot of times they don't really realize that. And for everybody's kind of in their own world and trying to get their own tasks done, and a, a service advisor, a technician, a service manager is no different. Um, but if you can break it down into those simplistic terms and really get people to connect, then it's going to go a huge, huge benefit for your whole dealership. And guess what? It's a benefit for the customer too, because now they've opened up to where you can advise them properly. And it's really about reciprocity um, in that, you know, if I'm nice to you as my customer, then you're at least going to listen to what I have to suggest to you and take it in mind and consider it. Now, if I don't make that connection, if I'm not nice to you, if I haven't made some rapport with you, then exactly the opposite is also true. And so um, from a high level, you know, I think that uh, that needs to be top of mind, every store, everywhere on planet earth and elsewhere where there are service departments in the universe. Do you think that, um, no, I totally agree by the way. And we're, you know, I, I want to develop that a little bit as well, but, yeah. um, wanted to, to kind of cover the, the requirements, if you will, or the metrics from the manufacturer for a moment, because I feel like yeah. they're a little realistic and not all the brands, but some of the brands are still requiring two, two visits per year. Right. Uh, right. Know, to be, sort of be checked off in their box as retention. Is that really, does that really make sense in today's world when you have 10,000 mile intervals, uh, the cars, you know, like they don't need, you know, like there's no tune ups and stuff like that. Like, is it, does it really, is that really realistic or are we just setting up dealerships for failure? No, I think that there's a lot of that that goes on from the manufacturer level. And, and let's face it, we've all experienced that. And I'm not saying there aren't some great manufacturer people out there, but in, in general, they, they don't carry forth the attitude and the experience of being a dealer of opening the doors in the morning turning the lights on facing a customer when they're not at their best and so a lot of uh, customer experience metrics and retention metrics and, and a lot of that stuff i think is um is is at least poorly calibrated you know so and to your point if you've got a 10,000 mile interval, then you're going to be lucky to see them, you know, maybe twice a year, but more than likely once every 14, 15 months or something like that, you know? Um, so no, I, I certainly agree with that, but you know, the other thing is, and this comes up all the time, whether it be about surveys or retention or whatever the thing is. And, and in most cases, most manufacturers have a significant amount compensation to the dealer attached to it but um you know it kind of is in the realm of it is what it is and we can we have to work around those parameters it's uh you know it, it's an old cliche as well but you can't fight city hall but sometimes when the manufacturer has a um uh, a program like that unfortunately you you have to adhere to it as best you can and and you know work the pay plan so to speak but does it set dealerships up for for to do not so how do i say this without sounding um i mean i'm just gonna say it you know does it set dealers up to do things that are shady you know what i mean oh yeah I, oh, certainly it does yeah certainly it does maybe if you're, 
maybe like, not dictated from the. Uh, your I, pay plan is tied to it. Your, you know what I mean. You got all these things involved into it. Um, you know what I mean. So there's a lot of pressure there, man. To to there's to, a ton of pressure. You know, and and some stores that I work with that are larger stores, it's six figures a month that they stand to win or lose based on their um their metrics that the that the manufacturer has put down to them and, and a lot of those metrics have have to do with the re customer experience response from reviews or surveys or whatever and so what you're getting is a very 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 small segment of the population that are motivated to tell you something they didn't like rather than um a, a true sampling of everybody where one person that didn't like something's going to stand out a little bit against the sea of people who are, are really happy. But no, I, I, to your point, I think that it, it does set up uh, for um, at least individually. And if you got unscrupulous operators to, uh, to work the system for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously that trickles down to the customer as well, because then there's this added pressure, there's over communication. Um, you right. know what I mean? Just trying to get that customer in so we can, you know, check the box yeah. deal um, yeah and it, i think it just creates a lot of unnecessary pressure that ultimately ends up hurting the longevity right of their relationship with your customers now right, that, yeah internal, you know what i mean so I, completely and because and you're leaning on them to give you something that you need that may actually be an inconvenience for them and and you're you're kind of taking away some of that um good measure that you built up to use it just for that you know, instead of being able to use it to keep nurturing the relationship and and growing it for everybody's benefit. Now, you, you know, you're kind of leaning on them to uh, to give you a result that the factory is pressuring you to do. So I've definitely seen some very shady stuff in the past happen and that would blow your mind. You know, we probably have a whole session about that. But, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that 100 percent. Yeah, man. I mean, I think we need to get a little bit more in line and realistic with with the, with the times, the you know, the intervals that we have today and, and just the maintenance overall that the cars need versus what it needed. You know what I mean? 10, 15, yeah. 20 years ago. So um, anyway, so developing what you said a little bit earlier um, about, um, you know, the experience, you know, how mm -hmm. how to, how that helps customers or, or helps retention, excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I was having a, a session with uh, with Katie Mares, uh, yeah. which by the way, shout out to her, man. She she was awesome. I know, I love Katie. Yeah, it was a great She's session. Um, and we were talking about um, kind of what you were saying right now to give that that feeling to the customer, but do it early on in the interaction, right? Because what happens is when you do that, then yeah. the customer is willing to forgive more of the mess ups and all, you know, because inevitably you're going to, you can't make everybody happy. There's going to, you're going to run into situations where somebody screwed something up and there was a mistake made and the customer right. was impacted. But if you give them that feeling in the beginning, right, at the greedy right. sort of a deal, then you're more likely to, that customer is more likely to forgive and then re still reward you on the survey and then with repeat business. You know. Oh, sure. And, and I know you've been a, being a service manager, I know you've ran into this that, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong, that some of your worst irate, hard to deal with customers that had a problem in the long run ended up being your best customers, right or wrong? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And so, so rapport is a real thing. Okay. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people that, that may not be in the right position may um, bump back and say, you know, it's not my job to make friends with people and it's so phony or whatever. But really, if you don't have that demeanor that you like people and you're not willing to really put that out there, you you pretty much got the wrong skill set for the job. Um, so, um, you know, to her point, yeah, I mean, as soon as during the write-up process, you know as well as I do, there's three main things that need to happen. Is um, Number one is a really good first impression. So that is um, the greeting, okay? And that's Service Advisor 101, right? I always say that. And uh, But if it's Service Advisor 101, how come I can still walk into a $20 million dealership and nobody talks to me for five minutes, you know? Or they're like this. They're so ingrained in the process. Right. And I can appreciate that. 
you know but I mean? they got to take a minute and acknowledge it. Number two is building rapport. Turn right up. That's the second thing that really needs to occur is the beginning of building rapport. And it may, you know, initially when you first start in that, and I, I'm just, I like building rapport with anybody I meet. I don't even care if I'm going to get anything out of them. If I meet somebody in the grocery store or catch eyes with somebody, I always smile at people. It's just me. But um, building rapport is critical because like Katie was, was mentioning is um, you're going to have so much more leverage on somebody and they're going to, they're going to actually um, pay attention to that reciprocity I was talking about if you've got good rapport built. And number three, and a lot of advisors, um, you know, are, are leery about this and pick and choose when they do it. And, but number three is really advising. Mm -hmm. People got to know about, um, I call it the top three top priorities of uh, of of their vehicle every time they visit you. So if you can start the relationship off with those three things is is a, is a great greeting and um, the start or continuation of building rapport and honestly building rapport and then advising regardless of uh, the situation. You know, some they'll, they'll a lot of advisors or be in a situation where they're in a whirlwind and not being able to advise or they feel like they are or um, they they prejudge the customer or they already asked them not too long ago for the same thing. And they're they're nervous about asking them again when when I think that if you can just rely on the title is a the title itself is you're a service advisor. That doesn't mean you're a service seller or a service salesperson or, you know, certainly consultant comes into that that uh that name but by advising you can really even just say that to a customer hey you know the choice is obviously yours my job is to give you the best advice is to advise you what you may need and why you need it and give you some options and pro help you prioritize it so that uh um it, it's completely transparent so yeah to, to katie's point that is a uh, very, very true is there a, a lot of ground can be covered just by simply having a good, close customer connection. So, so um, you said something there that, that it got, has me thinking um, about, you know, the advising part of the title, right? Yeah. Um, do you, are you, uh, how do I say this? Are you a proponent that we don't teach our advisors uh, sales techniques? I mean, do you believe in that? Um, well, I mean, I do have some very, let, listen, strategy is critically important. And um, I did listen to some of your other podcasts and, and um, particularly Damon Egan up there in Canada was talking about strategy that I caught and, and strategy is critically important and you got to have the right strategy. But I don't think it, it really, um, the strategy that, that I think works best and that I really um, try to educate and train uh, my dealers to use is really just sharing information in a prioritized way. So I mentioned a minute ago that, that every customer has got three priorities mm -hmm. and, and any repair order that you ever create, any repair order that has ever been created, any repair order open now in your shop, we owe a customer information on three areas of their car. And, and, Really, it's very, very simple, but every ticket you touch, every repair order you touch, you should be feel obligated to share the information about these three priorities. Number one is is obviously um, what they brought it in for. OK, that's what they call the prime concern. Right. OK, yeah. so uh, anything related to that prime concern is your first and foremost um priority for that customer's informationally and, and they don't want to be sold anything or even advised of anything or they don't want any more information on anything until you have satisfied in their mind that you are addressing or will address through the procedures you've explained their prime concern. But if we just do that, and I see a lot of this happening, or I see a lot of this happening where if I send a job back to the shop and it does have a concern on it. So there's a repair needed, right? And we have to do a diagnostic to figure out a accurate estimate to give the customer that ticket will come back up. That repair order will come back up to the advisor. And the only thing that it's got detailed is what we're going to need 
to address that concern. But there's two other priorities that really, as a dealership, as a service advisor, that we um, should feel obligated to um, to let our customers know about and give them the best advice on. And one of them, the next one, is anything that they shouldn't wait to have performed based on uh, decreased performance or safety or reliability. So what those are is um, stuff that's needed right now, stuff that's immediately needed. That's number two. And then number three is um, anything that is maintenance that's due or past due, but by the very nature of that it's a not immediately needed, it's something that could wait if it had to wait. So as far as sales tactics, I don't think that we have to really be in the job of persuading as much as we do really executing a strategy of sharing those three priorities, everything prime and related, everything that's needed right now or that shouldn't wait, and anything that's maintenance that honestly could wait. Right. And what you're doing right there also is by advising in that method is by sharing the things honestly that could wait with them and letting them know, hey, these could wait if they needed to wait. Listen, if the, if the customers that are going to buy the full meal deal, they're going to buy it. It doesn't really matter how you present it to them. OK, but everybody need, else needs an option B. And so um, by presenting it in that method, you're you're doing two things is is you're executing your strategy and you're also really in for the customer's best perspective because you want them to really have the information they need to make a logical decision you know and if they're going to keep the vehicle for a for quite some time and and listen a lot of people are really looking for longevity i googled it yesterday because i was having this just very discussion with a with a group of technician and advisors and you know in the states here the typical age of an automobile on the road i'm not saying this is the typical age in your dealership but the typical age of a dealership on the road is 11.8 years now and, and so that's it's going up. By the way. so yeah yeah it's it's ticking up a little bit every time i check it and i you know I, I typically check it every few months when i'm having a heated discussion with a group of people but um you know as far as salesmanship there's so much that we can do about just executing the basics and just um, sticking to our prime strategy of keeping the customer informed properly on those three basic areas that the salesmanship is really secondary. I mean, you know, it's uh, it, in a lot of cases, you don't really even need to have a, a sales aptitude because if you've made good record, rapport with that customer and you're advising them consistently, you're advising them at write up. You're doing a great multi-point inspection and getting it back to them in a timely manner. And you're advising them in a prioritized way after the inspection, the sales are going to come. What happens more typically is it's a matter of picking and choosing who I'm going to present to and how I'm going to present it as a service advisor. So, um, well, my yeah. contention with that yeah. is that we, we, um, how do I say this? We we don't train the, the advisors the same way. We don't put the same emphasis on training our advisors like we do salespeople, for example, which blows my mind because the advisor to me has a better relationship with that customer. We're so focused on yeah. sell, right? We're so focused on that. Yeah. Well, and, and you, you hit the nail on the head there. And, and, we and I, I always try to refocus. I always try to refocus my dealers that will have an ear to this to exactly what you're talking about. You know, one general manager I was working with recently, I was sitting at his desk and it said, um, uh, if you can measure it, track it. If you can track it, reward it. And, you know, there's a couple thousand dollars, maybe at a minimum that, that gets handed out to salespeople on a Saturday to incentivize them to get out there and, and make something happen. And, you know, training to me means practice. And certainly in a sales department, you've got almost daily in good ones, a, a practice arena to, to bring those out. And it, it helps you to get the, the cobwebs out. It helps you get the butterflies out. And, you know, I hear this refrain a lot of times in the, in the service department is no one ever trained me. Okay. But, 
I would contend that you kind of train yourself once you know what the strategy is, you know, and I'm not saying coaching isn't very important and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, as far as training, training means practice. And if the more you practice something, the better you're going to get at it, the more natural you're going to feel, the more habitual you're going to, it's going to become. And the more like a, a muscle memory that it's going to be so that you can focus on the critical things that are important to the customer, like them and attending to what their actual needs are as a person. And if you're, if you're training your strategy properly, it's going to kind of flow naturally. Well, but see, our, our the, the fixed up fix side of things, it's all work track related. And here's what I mean. Okay. You, you get a, a, a green P in there, right? Never done service before. Mm -hmm. you, you know, depending on your, on your training level, which is probably, there's probably not a lot going on. You're going to have him shadow somebody. You know, maybe you have like two people that they shadow before they go on the floor or whatever. Okay. And so that person is going to hear the word tracks of the person they're shadowing, mm -hmm. right? They're going to hear yeah. it over and over and over and over and over again. And when they're on the floor by themselves, you know, for the first couple of days or whatever, what are they going to revert to? What yeah. they're comfortable with, which is what they've been hearing over and over and over again. Which may not be the proper way to do it. There you go. The problem is that maybe that's not the right way or there could be a better way or the word tracks are not the right kind type of word tracks. But now you got this person that you're training sort of, right? Or they're training themselves on yeah. the wrong stuff. The and wrong then stuff. you ingrain this really bad behavior. You know no, what I mean? and, and hey, I, I was, you got a, a very, very good point there. And I was in a, another scenario yesterday at a store. And, and this is, and I'm sure you've seen this happen, is they had a hard, they've had a hard time getting enough service advisors for the drive. And so the ones that were there, Hey, they were having to take the path of least resistance. Okay. And so some of the shortcuts they were doing, God bless them. We needed them too, because you got, you may have four five, six people in the drive. And if, you know, if you're going to spend that extra time to, to do every single facet of the process before you get to the next person, they're going to take off. They're going to leave, you know? Right. And so what happened and, and one person in particular that is still at the store has been habituated. She knows what to do. And, and actually she was exit, you know, when we got back in, in the swing yesterday, she was executing it flawlessly and getting great results, but she had, and, and again, God bless her because we forced it on her. She had habituated herself to taking shortcuts and going with the path of least resistance. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the, the, the habits that you create, however you get them, and yeah, if you're shadowing somebody, a lot of times they might think it's very corny, for example, to do some of the things you really want them to do. And they want to be cool or they want to be, you know, not seen as a nerd or whatever. So they're not going to they're not going to put the full act on in front of in front of your newbie that is just shadowing. Right. So you can easily get somebody that's uh, that's habituated in the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Sure. Um, all right. So kind of, uh, you know, before we leave the whole retention, you know, we, I know we kind of went on a tangent here, but I want to get back to that because there's one yeah. question that I wanted to uh, develop with you. Um, what's more important in your opinion? Okay. Focus on retention or focus yeah. or focus on service market share. Retention. Uh, obviously I think that, you know, and again, I was just chatting with a buddy of mine, about this very thing. And he was contending, hey, 70% of um, your business is going to the aftermarket. You pass the aftermarket, you pass your pet boys, you pass your Joe's garage, you pass your mom and pop incorporated and they're covered up and there's, we're not getting that stuff. But the dealers I, I'm involved in and, and that's, you know, quite a few and it's, it, it, it never seems to vary are not doing a great job of really caring for the customers that they have. So what's going to happen if we get more customers in the mix that we're not doing a great job is, is we got more opportunities really to, to screw up and we've got more, more opportunities to drive people away and to, and to relate that behavior to their friends and family and, and to really 
create the wrong vicious cycle in our dealership. So I'm a, you know, and obviously my business is to coach and train people into maximizing their current traffic and to maximizing their performance with each customer. So that's one of the things that I am really um, foundationally for. So that my pick is retention for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you made a good point, right? If your processes aren't tight and you're growing your service market share, then you're just expanding that, you know, those bad. Uh, uh, you're just expanding the bad vibes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I don't know, man. I also feel that on the on the other end, retention grows or service market share can grow your retention. It, it you know certainly I mean? can. So when you've got the right processes in place and we're executing you know, a fair percentage of the time and you feel like you could send your grandma there without having to prep anybody and she'd get taken care of. Right. Absolutely. Please. Yeah. Add some more fuel to the fire. But more often than not, um, I'm finding we don't have enough techs. We don't have enough advisors. And, you know, we're really struggling to do the right thing with the people who are at our store. So that's kind of my take on it. Um the uh, so you know retention to me is 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 all about um, you know client relationships and making sure that clients honestly feel like uh, they're under your care. Yeah, and well, you know, and I agree, I agree totally. But the the reason why I why why I asked that question is because again, I mean, we were talking about the 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 how it's mandated from the manufacturer on down and all the pressure that that puts on the on the fixed up side of, of the business. Um, but we're also shrinking our, our, our audience place, man, when we do that too, because when you think about it, that retention pool in, in most cases is up to seven years uh, UIO, right? Yeah. And the mean year is 11.8. Right. Leaving a lot of customers outside of the mix. You know what I mean? Um, well, yeah. And, yeah. You know, and, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I will also say that there is a point, and let's say it's seven years, that most dealerships don't want to see that car after that. Why? Because it's going to be prone to perhaps a high mileage car, to having a comeback that was unrelated to what we worked on, to having additional problems that uh, may we have to do a policy adjustment on, to not being able to get parts that we can get in and out of the shop easily. So I think there is a segment of aftermarket work that we're not getting that we don't want. We don't want it. We 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 want the the stuff that's typically seven years or newer, and and um, we can service it. We can get the parts on it. We we've got an off the shelf fill rate of ninety five percent or better. We can get the car in and out. We don't have any hassle of you fix one thing and now something else is broken. So, you know, I, I do think that that in those retention numbers, it's a it's a it's kind of a shotgun, and that uh, only a, a segment of that stuff that we do want. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good point. That's a good, that's a good perspective. I mean, I obviously I'm thinking dollars and cents and I would like old agers, higher mm -hmm. tickets. You know what I yeah. Mean? Um, higher but tickets yeah, I mean, perhaps, but higher trouble, higher yeah. chance of the customer may not be, um, let's face it, may not be financially well enough to be able to afford the repair on that. But you know, there are tools for that. And, and, uh, but no, I, I and 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 I'm not saying I completely advocate it, but I, I do see in the field that a lot of dealerships don't want that stuff that's older than than seven years. Um, right or wrong, that's just the fact. Um, you know, uh, and, and certainly there's money there, and and if they don't have a car coming in right now and they're slow, yeah, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. But uh, <laughs> you know, once they get there and and the 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 thing sits on your lift for two weeks and, and you can't get parts on it and it's completely down. And now that you fix the motor, the transmission's going out on it and you're running in circles to find parts on it. It can be a, it can be a trick bag. Yeah. You know, um, that's a, that's a, that's a uh, kind of a good segue here too, because I wanted to touch on um, kind of where we are industry wise. And, and let me break this down for a second. So when I was doing it, it was more, we were busy, man, in the sense that we had, it wasn't a lot. And maybe it was 30% maintenance and 70%. Oh, yeah. You know, like tune timing belts, you know, that sort of deal. Now it's like 70% oil changes, entire rotations. 
And so we're, we're packed all the time doing these maintenance things. It's, a, it's starting to affect the experience because of the, the amount of people that are going to the dealership to get that done. Combine that mm-hmm. with the tech shortage, um, you know, and all these things that are kind of snowballing right now. Um, how do you see that balancing out, man? Like, or where, or, or maybe a better question is how do you see the, the, the money ratio of balancing out? Because I mean, you, if you're doing 70% maintenance, if that's flipped that drastically, there's, there's loss of money there, man. Cause you know, right. back in the day, those were t- well, bigger t- items. No, I agree with that. And you know, um, you got to do what you can to, to protect your grosses and your, your effective labor rate um, within that. And everybody's got a mix of business. And like you said, you know, if you're running 70%, I think 70 is probably uh, pretty, pretty strong, but cer- certainly if you're running 60, 40 maintenance to repair, then you, <coughs> a couple things need to happen is number one, we got to constantly, I mean, in, in this sense, we've got two types of business in our shop. We've got repair work, which is somewhat proprietary particularly if it's seven years and newer and you've got maintenance work, which the maintenance work is competitive. So it's going to be that you don't want to be the highest because you're not going to get enough customers to come in, right? You can make good grosses on them, but not enough volume. And you don't want to be the lowest because in a sense, you're going to get too many customers and, and you just uh, not, not making enough money, but you want to be right in the middle there. So that mix, let's call it 60% of your business. Um, has got to be calibrated properly so that if you are penetrating that well, that it does make money and still within the scope of a competitive nature. On the other hand, that repair work, we got to take an opportunity to um, look at that very frequently, make sure our advisors aren't taking liberties into um, excessive discounts, et cetera. And that, that effective rate of that mix of work is proper to come up with an overall arching uh, amount of gross profit and 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 rate retention that uh, that you can. So, and there's a lot of other things in the mix too. Like, um, uh, you know, I was dealing with some dealers earlier in the week that um, that have um, warranty rates that are subpar. So the warranty, as you were saying. Nowadays, maybe 30% or less of their mix, but if their warranty rate is so divulgent from their retail rate, then guess what? They're still paying, a, <clears throat> even more so, they're paying a $40 tech to do that work that they're only collecting a hundred bucks out of or whatever. And so, you know, it's to the, the dealership's um, best, um, it's to the dealership's best interest to make sure that they're constantly looking at those rates and, and applying for their retail warranty rates when they can do so. Most states these days allow you to get a parts uplift and a labor uplift on that warranty. And although it only constitutes 30% of your work, again, you've got your most qualified technicians working on that segment of work. Um, so, you know, a, as an overall picture, the, um, the, gross retention that is retained from those three elements from warranty uh, and, and warranty is going to be what it is. Uh, you right. know, you're going to get what you get. You can't upsell it. Same thing with internal, you know, you may be able to persuade your used car manager, but they've, they've got to dictate about how much they're going to spend per car. And you, you're not, you, you know, you, you're probably not going to be able to um, focus should always be in my opinion, CP, because that's what you can control I and mean, you can't control. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But if you've got your, if you've got your rates wrong, then that's going to uh, lead to the wrong outcome. And so I would urge you at least on a quarterly basis uh, is to mystery shop your competition and to do uh, the repair order surveys that give you the clearer picture of, of what's happening with your pricing strategy. So, you know, you may not even know how bad you're, you, you may have advisors that are bouncing your rate and, and applying discounts. And so where you can, uh, most DMSs, um, you can at least lock them out from changing the sale account and make them do a, 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 um, a coupon code, for example, but, you really have to be protective of those two categories, really three categories of pricing is one, the customer pay repair two, the customer pay maintenance. And again, you want to, you don't want to be the highest, but you don't want to be the lowest. And number three is, 
are we getting our fair share from the factory on the stuff that we have to do for them that we're paying a $40 tech for, and I'm only collecting a hundred bucks or whatever. And maybe my retail rates 129 or 149. And that's, you know, you're, you're only collecting 60% gross retention on, uh, on the highest level tech that you've got in the shop. Yeah. Dude, uh, this has been awesome, man. Yeah, you know, we're almost an hour into it. Um, I wanted to give you some time to uh, tell us a little bit more about your business and, you know, what you no, guys No, I appreciate doing. that. And then, Thank you. Uh, and, you know, what, what I got on my mind right now that m most dealers, and like I said, what, what I do is I help dealers maximize their current traffic through retail growth. Okay. Um, it starts from the management, but also through, uh, you know, service advisor technicians doing the right things. And, and what I find these days that more important than strategy is execution. And uh, a dealer friend of mine introduced me to a book recently that really kind of spells it out for the service drive. I want to go talk just real quick. And um, it's really the four disciplines of execution by Jim Hewling. Um, and let me go through those real quick. And you, I'm sure you'll find some parody with this is uh, number one is find the very few things that we are trying to um, to affect. So a wildly important goal. Right. Number two is acting on our prime metrics. And I'm not talking about analysis paralysis, but acting on those key metrics that actually drive. Number three is a compelling scoreboard. And again, anti-analysis paralysis but so everybody can see every day where they're at mm -hmm. number four and most importantly is accountability and um i like to to really purvey accountability through coaching through personal commitment and allowing that team member to decide the um what their goal and their action is to, to reach that goal so that's really what we do is we go into a dealer scenario and my favorite dealer scenarios to go in are, are those that are not particularly broken, but that just need to apply the basics to be able to get the, the uplift on them. And, um, you know, that's uh, that's where really I think most dealers are um, are struggling right now is the simple execution. So that's kind of what that's kind of what we do is um, just go into a scenario and help them lay out. You know, it is important to get everybody on the same page and to have the right strategy, but they're very basic strategies. And then the, the most important part is just really execution. And that's where we come in. Yeah. Love it, man. Love it. Dude, thank you so much for for coming on the show. This has been really awesome and really good conversation. I'm super excited to share this. I think we covered, you know, I really wanted to have the retention conversation. And I think uh, I think we had some points here that. that oh, you know, yeah. Appreciate. Me too. And re retention is my thing. And I, so I appreciate that very much. And, and again, I, I thank you so much for having me. And uh, I would love to do it again whenever you see fit. Yeah, man. Part two for sure. Um, okay. All right. That's all the time we have for today. Um, I do have one question, though, that I ask everybody that comes on the show. And Hit that me. question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years and why? Okay. What I see the automotive industry focusing on in the next five years is um, really, from a fixed op standpoint, is getting better at technology. I think there's a lot of beta technologies in the field right now that don't really work. And I'm sure you've experienced them that you have to do workarounds and, and everything. But I feel like the, the technology is going to get knitted together. Um, the things like kiosks that I heard Damon talking about on another podcast, the things like your tablet solution, the things like your texting solution, the things like your electronic multipoint inspections are not widespread yet. You know, they're in big markets and they're in big groups, but I think that's going to continue to get knitted together and it's going to make um, uh, a lot easier to be consumer driven because that's really where it's headed is what the consumer wants when they want it. So that I think there'll be a lot more technology, a lot more, um, really trying to um, obligate the customer where they want to be served. So pick up and delivery and, and things like that, that are going to be a more, a lot more convenience for the customer. Um, so they can do it on the fly, do it from their phone and, and get the job done. Technology. Right yeah, there it is. All right, folks. That's all. That really is all the time we have for today. <laughs> um, uh -huh. 
Uh, please, if you haven't done so, make sure to share this podcast, share this episode with somebody that can take this information back to the dealership and implement in their day-to-day. Uh, John, thank you again so much for joining us. Really appreciate yes, it. And as usual, folks, we'll talk later. Thank you.